Reformed is Not Enough, A Biblical Critique, Part 16. And today we're going to be looking at uh, his chapter on what is the true church or how to identify the marks of the true church. And uh, a very interesting study, a very edifying study for us in, uh, in looking at it from a biblical perspective. My text is uh, 2 Timothy 4, <clears throat> 1 through 3. 1 through 4, excuse me. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn away their ears from the truth and will be turned aside to fables. Verse 5, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. In our study of Re the book, Reformed is Not Enough, <clears throat> we come to Wilson's chapter 9. Let me try to pronounce it. He likes to use Latin to show off. Uh, Notia Ecclesia, uh, where he addresses the issue of the marks of the true church. And he writes, in addressing the objectivity of the covenant, at some point, we need to come to the questions about the boundaries of the covenant. If the covenant is not a category invisible to man, then by what marks are we to know it? Put another way, we have to consider the marks of, the tr of a true church. On what scriptural basis do we say that this group is within the covenant, that group outside? And the other group is off sitting in the gray areas. End of quote, and that's page 79. Well, there's some, cert there's some sloppiness here <clears throat> in that someone can be in the covenant without being a member of the visible church. The thief on the cross is an example. Now, that would be rare, obviously, but it, it does occur. And there were many who remained outside the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages who were true Christians. And they, re they remained outside the Roman Catholic Church uh, because of it was false as to well-being. <clears throat> Moreover, someone can be a member of the visible church <clears throat> and not really be a participant in the covenant of grace. Isn't that right? Lots of people are tares. They're goats. Christ says to the, the preacher on the day of judgment who was wicked, I never knew you. I never had a saving relationship with you. John says in uh, 1 John, uh, they went out from us, but they were never of us. They were never true Christians to begin with. So Wilson would be helpful if he defined what he meant by covenant. In addition, he should make it clear that he is discussing the covenant of church membership. Earlier we were told that everyone who is baptized and is called a Christian, even lesbian Eskimo bishops, should be considered a Christian. That's what he says. I didn't make that up. He actually says that. In addition, a number of Federal Vision apologists speak of baptismal efficacy and say that head for head, everyone baptized is united to Christ and is saved by Jesus' blood. Now, if that's true, all such people would already be members of the covenant. So the marks of the church wouldn't really that be big of an issue. Uh, it would be who's baptized. But uh, the federal vision is not known for being consistent. It's, it's an irrational system. <clears throat> but Wilson is speaking about where we should go to church. That's really what this chapter is about. He notes that this is necessary to figure out because we live in a sinful fallen age and there are false gospels. And he then asks a very important question. He writes, this is page 79, once converted by the gospel, it is our duty to attach ourselves to the company of the faithful. How do we find them? That's a very good question. Now this question leads to a very general rambling discussion of the topic. Wilson will talk about the Reformation pages 80 to 82, the radical sectarians, page 80, and they're the bad guys, the radical sectarians, who I believe he's speaking, he's very general in these chapters and doesn't get specific, uh, but I believe he's talking about the Anabaptist here. And then um, 
He talks about the Anglican Richard Hooker on uh, page 81, and he makes some very general comments. He says, <clears throat> the early reformers simply emphasized the preached gospel, baptism in the Lord's Supper. A later development added church discipline. And it is not hard to understand why. A church with no discipline is a church with no immune system. Without any discipline, how long will the gospel remain undefiled? How long will the word continue to be preached without uh, discipline of heretics? How long will the table of the Lord be undefiled without discipline of libertines? Page 80. And those are good questions. Wilson implies that there should be three marks of a true church. The pure preaching of the gospel, the correct administration of the sacraments, and church discipline. And this is somewhat standard. This is a, we could call this a standard Protestant view, if these terms are understood correctly. Wilson, in his discussion of sectarians, quotes Paul Avice, who argues that one of their chief problems was an obsession with discipline. And I'm assuming they're talking about the Anabaptists. I can't think of any other radical sectarians in the early part of the Reformation other than the Anabaptists. Now, their problem arose not so much from strict discipline, their problems, but from heresy and legalism. They held false interpretations of the gospel, and they imposed a Neoplatonic ethic that had nothing to do with Scripture. Discipline arising from a false standard that sees anything connected to this world as intrinsically evil, that's the, the Neoplatonism, is unwarranted and evil. So it wasn't that they were too strict or they were too into discipline. They, they had the wrong discipline. You know, if you have a church, a, a Baptist fundamentalist church, and everybody likes to gossip and backbite and slander each other, uh, but they won't have a cigar once in a while, or if you have a beer, you're excommunicated, you've got a problem. You've got a wrong standard. We call that legalism. Not legalism in the sense of denying justification, but legalism in the sense of making up your own ethics and not listening to the ethics of Scripture. Now, Wilson is a very loose subscriptionist in a functionally congregational communion that openly tolerates Romanizing worship, pedo communion, and a false doctrine of justification by faith. Now, when this controversy broke in 2002, and the RPCUS stood strongly against it, and Joe Moorcraft, who's really a hero, he's a hero of the gospel, and a great preacher, um, what did Wilson do? Did they have a presbytery meeting and discuss their doctrines? No. Wilson sat down with a session, and his session asked him questions. That's congregationalism. Now, consequently, if he really believed in justification by faith alone, and truly held to the teaching that the pure preaching of the gospel was a central, crucial mark of a true church, he would bring up the federal visionist in his communion, correct, the communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches, he would bring them up on charges. And uh, if they weren't disciplined for teaching a false gospel, he would leave Crack. But that has not occurred. At least I'm not aware of it occurring. If anybody has heard of him bringing up Peter Lightheart on charges or, or one of the other ministers on charges, uh, let me know. <clears throat> But he's blowing smoke. He refuses to defend the gospel doctrinally and judicially, and he helps men flee discipline for holding to Norman Shepard's heretical concept of justification by faith and faithfulness, or works. Okay, if you're in the PCA, and uh, some men who are defending the gospel in the PCA and you're fearful of them and because you think they're going to bring you up on charges, what do you do? You just leave the PCA and you join Crack. It's a safe haven for heretics. That's what it is. Crack has become a safe haven for heretics fleeing the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and the Presbyterian Church in America. 
So all this talk about the marks of the true church and we got to uphold discipline and all this stuff, you know, actions speak louder than words. Wilson's exceptionally loose subscriptionism rears its head in its focus on the gospel to the exclusion of the word and doctrines in general. And I don't know if this is deliberate or just an oversight on his part. Here's what Wilson says. This is, uh, oh, I forgot to write the page number down, but I would imagine it's around 80 or 81. We need to ask whether we should seek to find the center or the circumference. The questions that were raised by Rome at that time were about the boundaries of the covenant. The Reformation began with a striking emphasis on the center of the covenant, which was Christ and him crucified. But for the early reformers, <coughs> this center was not a series of abstractions about, about Christ, creedal definitions in the sky. Rather, the center was Christ preached and Christ given through the sacraments to be received by faith. The reformers said that you recognize a man by looking at his face, not the ends of his shoelaces. If you want to recognize the church, then you must look straight at her head, who is Christ. End of quote. Well, there are a number of problems with Wilson's, state, Wilson's statement. First, and this should be obvious to anybody listening, how does one believe in Christ as he is presented in the scriptures without creedal or doctrinal statements and definitions? How does one believe in Christ as he is presented in the scriptures without creedal definitions? You have to believe in what the scriptures say about Christ because everything we know about Christ is given to us in propositional form by the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. Charles Taze Russell, Joseph Smith, Paramahansa Yogananda, Mary Baker Eddy, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin would all say they believe in Christ. But how do we know if the object of their faith is really Christ? One must resort to theology or creedal definitions. Can Christ be faithfully preached without theology or creedal definitions? How do we discern the difference between uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon or, and Jonathan Edwards and people like Joel Osteen and Norman Shepherd's preaching of the gospel? How do we discern who's right and who's wrong? We must appeal to the theological system presented in Scripture, the faith once delivered to the saints, and that's doctrine. That's theology. I don't know of any theology up there in the sky. Second, while there are many people who may focus on peripheral matters, the circumference, and thus neglect a proper emphasis on the gospel, which we could call the center, One cannot properly preach the gospel without also teaching all the crucial doctrines that support and help define the gospel. Okay, there's a system of doctrine, apostolic doctrine. The faith once delivered to the saints, it's a system. It's not this narrow little thing, except Jesus in your heart. Or even just believe in Jesus, which of course is thoroughly biblical. You need to believe in Jesus, but it's a system. The gospel in the broad sense. One cannot properly preach the gospel without also teaching all the crucial doctrines that support and help define the gospel. To really understand the gospel in all its richness, we need to know many other doctrines. Creation, God, the Trinity, the fall, sin, the moral law, the judgment, the two natures of Christ, the divine and human natures, the atonement, etc., and if you look at the preaching of Christ and you look at the preaching of Paul, they almost always talk about God and the law before they talk about the gospel. Because if you don't understand that you're a sinner and you don't know what sin is and you don't know what God is and the moral law is, 
who God is, then the gospel is meaningless. And then it descends into the Joel Olstein, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, uh, false gospel of just, well, God wants you to be happy. And God wants you to be rich. And he wants you to drive a Cadillac. And he wants you to have better shoes and a nicer house. And that's what the gospel has become. Because you need all those other doc doctrines to understand the gospel. For this reason, the primary mark is the pure preaching and profession of the word. The word. Calvin writes, this is from the Institutes, <clears throat> we recognize as members of the church those who by confession of faith, by example of life, so he's got discipline in there already, by example of life and by partaking of the sacraments, profess the same God in Christ with us. How do you know if you're professing the same God in Christ with us? Well, you have to have the right doctrine, and your life has to demonstrate that right doctrine. And he continues from the Institutes. From this to the face of the church comes forth and becomes visible to our eyes. Whenever we see the word of God purely preached and heard, and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, then it is not to be doubted a church of God exists. End of quote. When we see the pure preaching of the gospel in various reform symbols, they have in mind a whole biblical system of thought. The Westminster Confession defines it as the profession of the true religion. So I don't have any problem saying one of the marks of the true church is the pure preaching of the gospel, but keep in mind that also includes the pure preaching of the word of God. In rejecting the Roman Catholic concept of the church, and their idea of unity, which is basically, you know, their idea of the church is the church government, the leaders of the church, the pope, the archbishops, the bishops, the priests, and so forth. And then you attach yourself to them, and that's how you become part of the visible church. It's a very external thing. Well, in opposition to them, Protestants understood that a faithful adherence to the word of God was a central mark of the true church. And they rejected the Roman Catholic concept of unity. Herman Bovink writes this, and this is just fantastic. This is from his, his big systematic theology, the, I think it's four volumes. Quote, that the Refor Reformation rightly sought the key mark of the church in the word of God cannot be doubted on the basis of scripture. Without the word of God, after all, there would be no church. Proverbs 20, 19, Isaiah 8, 20, Jeremiah 8, 9, Hosea 4, 6. Christ gathers his church, Matthew 28, 19, which is built on the teaching of the apostles and prophets by word and sacrament, Matthew 16, 18, Ephesians 2, 8, 2, 20. By the word, he regenerates it, James 1, 18, 1 Peter 1, 23, engenders faith, Romans 10, 14, 1 Corinthians 4, 15, and cleanses and sanctifies the church. John 15, 3, Ephesians 5, 26. And those who have thus been regenerated and renewed by the word of God are called to confess Christ. Matthew 10, 32, Romans 10, 9, to hear his voice, John 10, 27, to keep his word, John 8, 31, 32, 14, 23, to test the spirits, 1 John 4, 1, and to shun those who do not bring this doctrine, Galatians 1, 8, Titus 3.10, 2 John 9. The word is truly the soul of the church. All ministry in the church is a ministry of the word. God gives his word to the church. And the church accepts, preserves, administers, and teaches it. It confesses it before God, before one another, and before the world, in word and deed. In the one mark of the word... The others are included as further applications. Where God's word is rightly preached, there is also the sacrament. There also the sacrament is purely administered. The truth of God is confessed in line with the intent of the Spirit, and people's conduct is shaped accordingly. Even Rome cannot deny that the word of God is the mark of the church. Gerhard. I 
I missed something here. Garrett notes, there are numerous church fathers who say this plainly and clearly. Thus Tertullian states, those are the true churches that adhere to what they have received from the apostles. In earlier times, says Chrysostom, it should be shown in various ways which was the church of Christ. But since, her but since heresies have crept in, it can only be demonstrated by means of the scriptures. In any case, those scriptures are simple and tr true, so that by using them, it can be easily determined by which doctrine, which doctrine is true. Augustine repeatedly speaks in this vein, quote, between us and the Donatists, that question, where in the world is the church? What are we going, where are we going to go? What are we going, how are we going to seek it? In the words of Donatus or in the words of his head, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that we ought to seek it in the words of him who is the truth and who knows his own body best. For he knows who are his own. End of quote. So, what is the primary mark of the true church? The pure preaching of the word of God. The true preaching of the word of God. The faithful preaching of the word of God. And that, of course, includes the pure preaching of the gospel. Now, the gospel is focused on a lot in the early times because Rome denied the gospel. But the federal visionists deny the gospel as well. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> now, regarding the marks of the church in Reformed theology, Burkhoff writes this, quote, <coughs> this is from a systematic theology. Quote, Reformed theologies differed as to the number of the marks of the church. Some spoke of but one, the preaching of the pure doctrine of the gospel. Beza, Alstead, Amias, Hydenus, Marcius, others of two. The pure preaching of the word and the right administration of the sacraments. Calvin, Bollinger, Zacchaeus, Junius, Gumarus, Maastricht, Amark. And still others added to these a third, the faithful exercise of discipline. Hyperius, Martyr, Ursinus. Trelcalcius, Heidegger, Wendelinus, end of quote. The Confession of Augsburg, which is very early, I think it's the 1530s, Article 7, the French Confession, Article 28, the Confession of Saxony, Article 11, these are all very early confessions, and the Confession of Wittenberg, Article 32, all list two marks. The pure teaching of the gospel and the right use of the sacraments. The Belgic Confession, Article 29, and the Scottish Confession list three. The pure preaching of the gospel, the lawful administration of the sacraments, and the proper use of ecclesiastical discipline. <clears throat> Both of these confessions, however, give the preeminence to the first mark by saying that all things, including the sacraments and discipline, must be done in accordance with God's word. The Westminster Confession of Faith, 25.2, and the larger catechism, answer to 62, both wisely focus all our attention on the one primary mark, the profession of the true religion, apostolic Christianity. Paul calls it the faith once delivered to the saints. Once scripture, the canon of scripture is closed, everything we're required to believe is there. Now, if one carefully analyzes the teachings on this topic by the Reformed and Presbyterian churches in the 16th and 17th centuries and apply scripture and logic to their arguments, one could easily come to the conclusion, <coughs> and uh, Bob Inc. kind of does this, there's one primary mark of the true church and there are two other marks that are dependent upon and naturally follow the first mark. The primary mark of the true church is the pure preaching and profession of the word of God. That's the primary mark, because everything is dependent on the word. A true church must preach true apostolic doctrine. It must teach the system of doctrine that is taught in sacred scriptures. The faith once delivered to the saints, and that's not Paul, that's Jude, Jude 3. This obviously includes the pure preaching of the gospel in the broadest sense of the term. And when we talk about the gospel... If you say, well, you're forgiven by Christ, but you don't teach the divinity of Christ, you can't preach the gospel. Because if Jesus was only a man or some great angel, he could only offer a sacrifice of finite value that could only save maybe one or two people. But as God, he can offer a sacrifice of infinite value. See, these doctrines are all inter intertwined. The two secondary marks 
are the lawful administration of the sacraments and the proper exercising of church discipline. Now, why do we identify true apostolic doctrine of the pure preaching of the gospel as the primary mark of a true church? Well, the first reason is that biblical teaching or doctrine is necessary in order to define the sacraments and their proper use, as well as define what is sinful and deserving of church discipline. <clears throat> if you're going to be disciplined by the church, they have to identify either a sin or a false doctrine that you're advocating. And then they have to go to you and they have to prove it using scripture. And then they have to give you at least two or three opportunities to repent of your sin or your false doctrine. If you don't repent, you're barred from the Holy Supper. And if you don't repent, if you continue in obstinacy, then you're excommunicated. But everything is based on the Word of God. If one is in a church in which true doctrine is believed and taught, then the fruit of such a belief and teaching will be exhibited in the other two marks. A second reason is that a church which ceases to preach the true gospel immediately becomes a false church. But a church can exist for a time without the sacraments, as was the case of Is the Israelite church, which neglected circumcision in the wilderness for 40 whole years, Joshua 5, 4 to 7. They didn't cease to be the church, even though they didn't participate in the sacraments for 40 years. Now, it wasn't right, but they didn't, you know, they didn't do it. Further, a church which corrupts discipline can exist for a time before it becomes totally apostate. But if you deny the gospel, you're done. The reformers and their stepchildren understood that in a, in a fallen world, there is not an infallible interpreter of the word of God. There's no pope. who ha All churches err. There is not an infallible interpreter of the word of God and that errors in doctrine as well as divisions in the body of Christ are the result of sin. Divisions are always a result of sin. Whether sinful behavior or sinful doctrine, heretical doctrine. In addition, they understood that not all errors instantly or automatically result in apostasy. There's different levels. The Confession of Faith 25.4 says this, even says, quote, and particular churches, which are members thereof, that is, they're part of the universal church, are more or less pure accordingly as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced, ordinances administrated, and public worship uh, performed more or less purely in them, end of quote. Now, even if this is a statement about national churches, it certainly applies to different communions and denominations. The Armenian Baptist Church down the road, where they get a rock band and liturgical dancing, is, well, they're Armenian, they, they preach a false gospel. But let's say they're Calvinistic. They're far less pure than a conservative Presbyterian church. There are different degrees of well-being and purity among the various communions. One must not categorize a Protestant Bible-believing church that is Calvinistic or Augustinian in soteriology, that has some errors in doctrine and corruptions in worship as an apostate church. They're still preaching the gospel, they still believe in the Trinity, they still believe in the divinity of Christ, but they have, some, they have defections in worship and some defections in doctrine. Different communions, like different individuals, have different levels of sanctification. Such a church may be somewhat corrupt as to well-being, but it is not a false or tot it is not uh, fatally or totally a false church as to well-being. <clears throat> a church that rejects justification by faith alone, by grace alone would have to be rejected as a false church as to well-being. The Roman Catholic Church. Churches that have a pastor that preaches the federal vision. Churches that t consistently teach Arminianism are false churches. 
So this would include Arminian, Neonomian, and all Federal Vision churches. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, could be considered a synagogue of Satan. Even though there may be a few real Christians within the Roman Catholic Communion, not because they faithfully follow the Roman Catholic doctrines, but because they are inconsistent with the Roman Catholic doctrines. And this is true of Arminian churches as well. You know, you might have an old Arminian lady in an Arminian church, but she certainly prays as a Calvinist and thinks as a Calvinist. <clears throat> there are few real Christians in her midst because their beliefs are inconsistent with real papal doctrine. And we could say the same thing about Arminian and Federal Visionist churches. There are people who would say, I'm a federal visionist, who are thoroughly mixed up, because if you study the theology of these guys, it's a very mixed up, poorly written out, poorly thought out, irrational system. So there probably are people who think they're federal visionists, and they're really not. Or they just imbibe some of the weirder things of the federal vision and don't deny justification by faith alone. The Reformed and Presbyterian churches understood that because of sin, ignorance, Human traditions and different levels of spiritual insight and growth, there may be different views of church government, the sacraments, worship, salvation, and church discipline among profession Christians. But this did not lead them to throw up their hands in frustration and adopt unbiblical forms of ecumenicalism or loose subscriptionism or functional congregationalism. That's what we have among much of modern conservative Presbyterianism today. You can go to an OPC, a PCA church or an OPC church where you think you're in an Episcopal church. And you can go to one where you think may think you're in a charismatic church. And then you can go to one that's, you know, acting like Presbyterians. You have to go there to find out because they're, they're quite different. They understood that unity... True unity can only be found or obtained by adhering to the truth and by practicing the truth. Therefore, they made great efforts in producing doctrinal statements, confessions, catechisms, articles, where scriptural doctrines are set forth, explained, defined, and systematized so that the church or communion is unified in the truth. So when they talk about the mark of the true church being the proper teaching of the word of God, the proper preaching of the word of God, the proper profession of the word of God, the profession of the true Christian religion and so forth, uh, they backed it up by their actions. An institutional unity that is formed by allowing diverse and diametrically opposed beliefs and practices is not only a false unity, but also a dishonest unity for the church is supposed to confess the same things. To treat important doctrines as things indifferent or matters of adiaphora is to act both as a Romanizing bishop, taking an authority upon yourself that you do not possess. The word of God is the authority, the elder or the pastor uh, is simply to implement what the word teaches, that he does not have an independent authority of scripture. And it's also to act like a secular pragmatist. And we find this all the time in denominations today, in conservative Presbyterian denominations. Protestant communities have used creeds and confessions to protect and further the well-being of the church. And they have used them as set boundaries for membership, unity, and communion. They serve as a fence or enclosure to guide the elders in discipline and protect the flock from false or heterodox teachers. So we should have great respect for the reform symbols. When subscription to a standard becomes a vague, general, equivocal adherence and radically different views of doctrines are permitted, you know, you've got all these different doctrines of creationism in the PCA and the OPC and even the RPCNA. You've got all these different views of God's law. You've got different views of covenant theology. You have different views of justification by faith. You have different views of the nature of saving faith. 
You've got different views on worship. The regular principle is pretty much a dead letter in the OPC and the PCA today. And people do what they want. You've got different views of the sacraments. You've got churches where they're practicing paedo communion, which is absurd and totally unscriptural. And all these things are openly tolerated in the name of love, unity, love and unity. Creeds and confessions are no longer set boundaries. They're suggestions. They're vague. The fence protecting the church is piecemeal and defective. And the result is a church in decline where humanistic diversity and declension is permitted to spread over time. This is the situation we find ourselves in, in the OPC and the PCA, and to a lesser degree in the RPCNA. What, what, what saves the RPCNA is their exclusive psalmody without musical instruments tends to force wacky theologians away where they can do their own thing. Even though there's a lot of people within the RPCNA, a lot of ministers, there's elders and stuff that don't believe in any of that. They just go through it out of tradition's sake. <clears throat> Wilson in this chapter is presenting the marks in a manner that is designed to justify loose subscriptionism because he wants Reformed people to accept their new Romanizing sacramentalist paradigm. Remember, oh, we've got to focus on the center. We've got to focus on Christ. We've got to focus on the gospel, not the periphery, not the circumference. The basic argument, he's very clever. He implies this. He doesn't go right out and say it, but his basic argument is that we must not be like the radical Anabaptists, the radical separatists who focus too much on church discipline. Instead, we need to be like the early reformers who focused on Christ and the gospel. <clears throat> but we have noted that theologians and early reform symbols focused on the proper preaching of the word of God and that the true preaching of the gospel was essentially a synonym for the proper preaching of God's word. They all started putting out creeds, catechisms, articles, confessions very early. And if you didn't hold to the Augsburg Confession, you couldn't take communion and you couldn't join their church. If you, you, you couldn't join the Lutheran church. If you were reformed in Germany, in the first half of the 1500s, you could be persecuted out of Germany and mistreated. And that did happen. And the history of the Reformation bears this analysis out. Lutheranism, the Reformation began by Luther in 1517. He was excommunicated by the Pope in 1520. Predates the rise of the Reformed Church under Zwingli. Uh, the first crucial uh, disputation occurred in 1523. Okay, Zwingli predates Calvin and Knox. And his first publication was 1525, Commentary on True and False Religion, which I have a copy of, and it has been translated into English. Yet Lutheran churches and Reformed churches have remained separate to this very day. They have different creeds, they have different professions, they have different views of the sacraments, they have different views of worship. <clears throat> no one doubts whether Luther or Zwingli were true Christians. The Lutheran Reformed churches did not unify because of doctrinal differences and differences regarding worship and the sacraments. Moreover, the Anglicans, the Episcopal Church, the Church of England, predates Presbyterianism in both England and Scotland. It began in 1534, and that's the Anglica Ecclesia, uh, Ecclesia the Anglicana Ecclesia. Presbyterianism in Scotland arose in the 1550s. 20 years later. Now, even though the early Anglican churchmen explicitly adopted justification by faith alone, the Presbyterians refused to join the older body because of Erastianism. That's the view that the, the state is the head of the church, or the king is the head of the church, or the queen is the head of the church, and differences over church government and worship. The Covenanters were willing to die and shed their blood over these differences. Things that you find in Presbyterian churches today that people openly adopt and brag about, 
they were willing to die not to do. Things have changed. Thus we see that Reformed and Presbyterian churches have always placed adherence to the truth above antiquity as a basis for church unity and pragmatism as a basis of church unity and false concept of Christian love as a basis for unity. They recognize that a church can be true as far as being is concerned, but be corrupt to a degree as to well-being, to the point of meriting separation. So were they saying that Lutherans weren't Christians? No, they weren't saying that at all. Were they saying that Episcopalians were not Christians? No, they weren't saying that at all. But they were saying that there was corruptions as to well-being that merited separation. One does not have to regard a church as apostate or heretical to justify separation. There can be errors in subordinate points of church government, worship, and doctrine that are serious enough to merit separation. If one rejects this assertion, then there is no biblical reason for Presbyterianism to be separate from the Anglicans or from the Reformed churches on the continent to be separate from the early Lutherans, the other Lutheran bodies, Because uh, in the early stages, they both accepted justification by faith alone, and the early Lutherans rejected free will, or what came to be called Arminianism. Attempts were made at unity between the Lutherans and the Reformed churches on the continent. And it couldn't be achieved. It couldn't be achieved. Because they were trying to have doctrinal unity by disputation and debate. But Luther and his successors would not abandon their radically unbiblical views of the sacraments. Consubstantiation, which is totally unscriptural and ridiculous. The blood of Christ, his body, is actually in, with, and under the elements of the bread and wine. So they say, the bread and the wine doesn't become Christ, it doesn't become his real flesh and blood, but his real flesh and blood part of his real humanity, is in, with, and under the elements, like there's specks of it or something. That's a denial, implicitly a denial of the, the true divinity of Christ. Uh, well, the true humanity of Christ. Because he ceases to be a real human if that occurs. It's ridiculous. The federal visionists teach a form of baptismal efficacy that is contrary to historic reform theology and really accords much better with High Church Episcopalianism or Lutheranism. Their strong rejection of the regular principle of worship also fits right in with Episcopalianism. And I didn't take the time to look it up, but Calvin, you know, talks about the twin pillars of biblical Christianity as the right doctrine of salvation and the right view of, of worship. And the Lutherans were not in agreement with the Reformed on worship. The Lutheran view is do anything you want, uh, as long as it's not obviously unscriptural, and the reform view is you have to prove everything that you do is by the scriptures before you can do it. That's a huge difference. Now, the church government of Crec is much more congregational than Presbyterian. Their view of justification, which comes from Norman Shepherd, has more in common with Roman Catholicism than the reform symbols. In addition, although they claim to be faithful Calvinists, their sacramentalism has forced them to teach things about individual election and perseverance that is more in common with Arminianism than the historic Reformed faith. And we've discussed this in the past. There are two types of election. One gets the job done and you're actually saved, and the other, you're saved temporarily, and then you fall away. And they teach you really lose your salvation. You really had it, and you really lost it. So they teach... They have a defective view of the atonement because Christ's blood doesn't get the job done. Would it not be more honest for the leaders and apologists of the federal vision to identify themselves with high church Anglicans or Anglo-Catholics minus the bishops? Now, it's my understanding that uh, Ray Sutton, who became the president of Reformed Episcopal Seminary in Philadelphia, who I was... That's where I went to seminary. Um, calls himself an Anglo-Catholic. And that they love this federal vision stuff. 
they love the sacramentalism. Such false doctrines and heretical concepts can only take root in Reformed denominations <coughs> that have departed from their doctrinal attainments for the sake of false pragmatic unity in the present. Now, one of the biggest problems with what we call loose subscriptionism <clears throat> is that it forces a communion to defend the lowest common denominator. Or innovative new doctrines that are not important, uh, that are not supportable through biblical exegesis. Because they've made a decision, we're going to allow, we're going to allow these different views of Genesis that are out of accord with the confession of faith and are out of accord uh, with the reform symbols and that are out of a corporate scripture, we're going to allow these weird views of Genesis uh, in our denomination. So they have to defend that now. Doctrines that are contrary to the plain meaning of scripture and the Westminster standards. This practice was just rooted in false concepts of love and unity, <clears throat> as well as pragmatism forces the church courts to stand against those who are the defenders of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. That is, those who are defenders of the covenanted reformation. They're the bad guys now. Because we've all agreed that we're going to allow all these weird teachings in the church. We're not going to have strict subscriptionism. We're going to tolerate all these different views of Genesis, these different views of the sacraments, these different views of justification, these different views of this, these different crazy views of worship. We're going to allow all that. And so you just speak against it. You're speaking against what we confess, which is loose subscriptionism. They, that is the defenders of orthodoxy, according to modern humanistic pragmatic eyes, become the bad guys because they are rocking the loose subscriptionist, anti-true subscriptionist boat. Don't rock the boat. Don't bring up things that we're doing that are corrupt. How dare you? Don't talk about us violating the covenants by celebrating Christmas, which is pagan and popish. It has nothing to do with the word of God. Yeah, we celebrate the incarnation every Sabbath, every single week. There's not a special day, and Christ wasn't born in December. It comes from a pagan holy day. Or by tolerating Peter communion, or by tolerating all sorts of crazy views of Genesis, that it's a poetic metaphor and it has nothing to do with reality. All this is heresy. It's garbage. This happened to J. Gresham Machen in the uh, PCUSA, where even the fundamentalists sided against him because they thought he was being unloving. He was hurting the unity of the church by standing up for the truth. <clears throat> and it is happening in our own day. Heterodox innovators are usually treated with kid gloves. Look at uh, Norman Shepard. He was never disciplined. They're treated with kid gloves. They're allowed to continue while those fighting for the attainments of the covenanted reformation are said to be unloving, crazy fanatics. And a lot of you are too young to remember, but when this thing broke and Joe Moorcraft was very publicly standing up for the gospel of Jesus Christ in 2002, 2003, the amount of heat he took is just mind-boggling. He lost a lot of people in his church. He took t tremendous heat. And they were mocking him and making funny, fun of him. The, the, the magazine out of Moscow, Idaho, called him Joe Macaroni and Cheese or something to that effect. They were mocking him. But he was standing up for the truth. He was persecuted for the truth. Consequently, loose subscriptionism makes declension acceptable and even inevitable. While making genuine reformation virtually impossible. Humanly speaking, God can do anything. Once errors in doctrine and practice are accepted, they are not only vigorously defended, but opposition to such errors is declared to be rebellious and radical. It is even compared to contumacy, because the widest church court has sided with the errorists. We tolerate these views of creationism. We tolerate these views of worship. We tolerate these corruptions. We tolerate these diverse doctrines. 
How dare you go against the General Assembly or the Presbytery? And what is that? Well, that's a form of Romanism. Because their authority is no longer the word of God. Their authority is in their own idea that, well, I have authority. I'm an elder. But the authority is not simply being an elder. The authority is the, the, the word of God. The sword is the word, not what you make up. For the sake of love, peace, and unity, we are told that we must accept corruptions in the church. But such a unity is not the unity described in Scripture. It is a schismatic false unity, as John Anderson ably notes. However much of our holy religion any body of Christians hold in common with others, and however many of us we judge them to be saints, yet while their distinguishing profession is contrary to the word of God, communion with them as a body so distinguished is sectarian communion, as it implies union with them and that which they ought to be rejected by the whole Catholic Church. And that's from his book, Alexander and Rufus. <clears throat> so false unity is sectarian unity. True unity requires separation. It does. You could not be a minister or an elder within the Presbyterian Church in the 1600s, all the way up until the Revolution Settlement, which is a great corruption, 1690, <clears throat> unless you swore to the covenants. Well, that's gone today to the detriment of the church, the big detriment of the church. Now, if we look <clears throat> at how the Reformed Church has defended a true church, defined a true church, and how the Reformed Communions developed confessions, catechisms, and articles to protect the health and attainments of the Reformation, we can only conclude that all Reformed churches have a moral duty, a Christian duty, to condemn the federal visionists as heretics who deny the gospel of pure grace and who advocate a number of serious errors that are contrary to the Reformed symbols. The loving, biblical thing to do is to tell them the truth about what they are doing instead of twisting logic and scripture to fit them into our humanistic, worldly, antinomian concept of love and loose subscriptionism. In the, in the same way, liberal Christians, when they tell homos, when they tell sodomites and cross-dressers and people who pretend to be women, who are actually men, that, oh, that's wonderful, God loves you just the way you are. Don't worry about it. You're not in sin at all. It's great what you're doing. They're not doing them any favors. They're, they're help sending them right to hell. We speak the truth in love, but we have to speak the truth. As Thomas McCree has ably warned us, quote, Let us not be unjust in seeking to be liberal. Genuine moderation and candor are not to be confounded with indifference and lukewarmness. Religion is of paramount importance, and we ought not to wonder that those who are in earnest about it should display a warm and fervent zeal in the cause. <clears throat> they do not feel themselves at liberty to make their own the same sacrifices to peace in the matters of the Lord, which they may be warranted and willing to make in their own. They must buy the truth but not sell it, Proverbs 23, 23. True religion is an, inherited, is an entailed inheritance, which they are bound to preserve and transmit unalienated and unimpaired to their posterity. That's from the Unity of the Church, 1821. Did the church listen to him? Uh, sad to say it did not. And that church is completely apostate today with not only women ministers, but sodomite ministers and lesbian ministers and so forth, practicing sodomites. The best defense against theological wolves is a return to honest, strict descriptionism. The fence must be repaired. 
a healthy reforming church that is growing in corporate sanctification over time will present to the world a vigorous, detailed defense and testimony. A testimony that deals with the pressing problems, sins, defections, and heresies that arise in our own time is what is necessary. Luther talked about this. He said, look, if, if there's a problem in your era and you're focusing on everything except the central problem of your own era, then you're not doing your duty as, as a watchman. You're not doing your duty as a preacher. And the Reformed Presbytery, which becomes the RPCNA, which becomes the Reformed Presbyterian Church in the United States and then later the Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America, back when they were solid in 1801, had it right when they declared this, quote, this is from an explanation in defense. That the church's testimony should be clearly stated in defense of truth and holiness and should also be faithfully pointed, not only against all error and immorality, but in a special manner against those errors and immoralities which much more remarkably prevail where providence hath ordered her lot. End of quote. As usual, Wilson has a number of good things to say in this chapter. But the good is mixed with propaganda. When men come up with heresies and new ideas to gain acceptance, they must present themselves as angels of light, as reformers who only want to help the church progress in sanctification and theological maturity. And that's how these men are presenting themselves. Reformed is not enough. There's a lot of good things in the standards, but we want to go further with the truth. We want to develop a more mature faith. And they're feeding you heresy. Wilson, however, is not a reformer. He is not even a clever heterodox innovator. He is simply introducing people to the heresies of Norman Shepard and James Jordan. Only when he publicly condemns the heresies of his Federal Vision com Visionist comrades publicly condemns them, brings them up on charges if they're in the crack, and he repents of all his false teachings, can we take his claims to be orthodox seriously. So I hope you understand the importance of strict subscriptionism and how do you choose the right church. Wilson speaks in a vague voice, but the standards speak in a clear voice. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for our heritage. Help us to be faithful to the covenants, to be faithful to the standards that we've sworn to uphold. And help us to fight for reformation against all error, to keep our testimony, to pass it along to the next generation intact, not worse, not declined, not full of error, not full of false worship, not full of covenant-breaking garbage, but your pure gospel, your pure preaching of the word, your pure worship. In Jesus' name, amen.